Well, how do you like our table, all set for Christmas dinner? I think it's one of the most gratifying few seconds for any uh, housewife, seeing a table ready laid for a lovely meal. I wonder how it ap appeals to you to have a boned and stuffed turkey for Christmas, because that's what we've done today. And that's what I've just laid down, all hot and ready for carving. But for the first course, I've done something very, very simple. All it is is fresh grapefruit and fresh orange, and you can see them all in a, a grapefruit case, ready to eat. Just very simple and not too filling, so that you have plenty of room for all the lovely things to follow. The turkey uh, here I'm serving with some lovely bacon rolls and gravy made from the residue in the bottom of the roasting tin. And I wonder if you saw me making that cranberry and orange preserve at the very first program of the series. More like a fruit cheese and very delicious with turkey and traditional as well. For vegetables, I've got what looked to you like very new potatoes, but I didn't buy them. And I'll show you what, how I got them uh, later on in the program. The vegetables today, parsnips with walnuts and butter, all tossed in that lovely buttery sauce and flavoured with fresh rosemary. Very unusual and delicious. But the most traditional of all vegetables with Christmas dinner, hot, lovely Brussels sprout, cooked to perfection, slightly cooked and no more, and just perfect for the table. Lovely and bright green. And that's the vegetables in the main course. Now for the pudding, of course, maybe you saw me doing the uh, Christmas pudding earlier on in the series, the traditional one, with the brandy butter to follow. But my bit of novelty today is a Christmas jelly. Very nice jelly with sherry in it and grapes and nuts. And brandy butter again to serve with that if you like, and two individual ones if you'd rather have separate ones. Now on the board here I've got a cold turkey with a lovely prune and walnut stuffing in it. And doesn't it look lovely with that dark stuffing and the white meat? Very nice for Boxing Day. Now all these recipes, these Christmassy recipes, are in our book, together with our usual lots of everyday recipes of the rest of the year. And the address for sending for the book will be coming up at the end of the program. Now I'm going to start with my bone stuffed turkey on page 30. Now, the turkey that I've uh, used in the recipe is one weighing between four and a half and five pounds. And this is how it looks when you get it, uh, first of all. The first thing I do is cut off the drumstick ends, that to there, and cut off the wing tips, the wing pinions, that down to that joint there. And I'm using either sturdy scissors or a pair of well-washed secateurs. You will need something quite heavy to c get right through them. But these are the, the two things I first do. Now, the bones that come out of the leg and the wing, quite apart from the carcass, which is the rib cage, is the big bone. I'm leaving the drumstick bone in, because usually you can carve off the drumstick and somebody will have that. But the big bone that joins from here into here, I'll see it better that way, that's the one I'm taking out. So that joint has to be cut and that one there. And at the back, on the wings, there are actually three bones here, and I've got them here. One, two, three. The tiny little flat bone in there, thin one, slightly bigger one there, and that one as well. So we're taking three bones out of the wing end and one out of the drumstick end. So that's the bird all ready to turn over and start the business of uh, opening it all up to get the bones out. Now, I've already done one side on my bird, there it is here. I've got the bones out and it's laid out flat and I'm all ready to start on the other side. I've taken out the two bone, three bones out of the wing end here and I'm all ready to carry on carving my way down the rib cage down to this next joint which I want to sever. But I want particularly to have a very sharp knife and I use a carbon steel knife for the, the some parts of this uh, job. Use a steel, keep the steel by you so you get a really good edge. Wipe your knife, of course, before you start. And then cut with very small movements, little short, sharp movements rather than big sawing movements. And try and keep as near the cage as you can. Try and leave as little meat on it uh, if, if you can do it. 
of course, you'll be able to use your carcass when you've finished boning it and uh, for a good pot of soup. Down it goes and pull and pull and stretch it down. I did actually at the beginning, uh, I think I forgot to say to take off the parson's nose. You don't really need it for this uh, job. Pull it down and use your fingers to pull it away. It's a pulling and stretching job rather than cutting all the way. I've got another little knife that I use, a little stainless steel one with a round end, which I use as I get nearer the breastbone where the meat is very thin and the skin is thin as well. So pull that down. I'm just coming down to this joint and pop my fingers in so that I feel where this joint is and take the scissors and give it a real good, that's it. So that's pulled again and I'm getting down towards the breastbone. And this is my little knife, this other one with the blunt edge that I want to use for pushing down the side of the breastbone so that I'm being very careful not to get into the, uh, to cut right through the skin. Now here's the little, little bone that's attached here. Again, pull it off. Right down here, and I've got into the breastbone here. Scrape it down with the back of the blunt end of this knife. Back to the top again. I can remember very clearly with the very first time I ever did this. I was so sick with fright at this point because I thought I was going to waste all this expensive bird. But in fact, although it looks a bit of a disaster at the moment, it will eventually look almost like a bird again once we get it stuffed. There we are, we're right down, to, there's the, the breastbone there. Lift it up and get it out. There we are. And if you do happen to break the skin, it doesn't really matter because you can always put a little stitch in because I'm going to stitch this bird up uh, to make it a, a nice shape rather than skewer it together. There we are. And that goes aside for a lovely pot of soup later on. Now this is the next bone I want to get out, the one that's attached to the drumstick. So I'll scrape it down at the top. There's quite a lot of sinews up there, so it's use an upward movement to get through them. And once you've got through them, put it on the side and scrape down. And you're going to need your heavy scissors or your rose secateurs to get through this big joint at the bottom. Feel it with your fingers so that you're not actually cutting through the bone. And there we have it almost ready for the stuffing. That's it. And there's the bird and we'll put the sides back on again. And it's always at this point, a lot of the recipe books always say that the, the boned carcass looks like a baby's vest, and that's just exactly what it does look like. So from there, we'll go on to the stuffing, which is, I hope you're going to enjoy this stuffing with prunes and walnuts. Just give my hands a bit of a wipe, and over here, I've got already. Now, out front here, I've got the ingredients that are in this stuffing. Seven ounces of prunes, which I will have soaked overnight until they're squashy and taken the stones out as well. Four ounces of whole wheat breadcrumbs, two ounces of chopped walnuts, two ounces of sultanas, the grated rind of a lemon, the juice of a lemon, and of course some parsley, just to give it a bit of color. Now in the bowl, I've already chopped up all the uh, prunes, chopped them quite small and added all these ingredients until it looks a bit like this. Now, some of the prunes that I've been using have been very, very moist and juicy, and I didn't really need beaten egg, which I've given in the recipe for 
putting the stuffing together. But I think this particular recipe is going, this particular bowlful is going to need some beaten egg. Now I've already fried a ch whole onion chopped quite small in one ounce of butter and uh, I've fried it until the golden stage. You can see that there. So that goes in, whole onion chopped small and just cooked to the gold stage. I mix that in again. At this point you can season it with salt, little salt, and a lot of pepper, and then as much of the egg as you can, to just to hold it together. It doesn't want to be too crumbly, just fairly moist. Now we'll try it with half of the egg and see how it goes. That's it. And there's the stuffing ready to go into our Bird. We always give our turkey a name at Christmas. He gets a different name every year. I think, uh, maybe you could, I don't know why we do that, but we always have done. I'll open the turkey out, and in this little bowl here, I've got the uh, two ounces of butter chopped up with some fresh parsley. And I want to spread some of that butter on the inside of the bird, just to give it a bit more lubrication and a bit more flavor. You don't have to do it terribly carefully because as it melts, it'll soon go running round all over the, the bird. It's just a bit stiff, actually. It could have been softer. And the rest of that will go on, on the outside of the bird to help with cooking. There we are, ready for the stuffing. A tablespoonful into each leg cavity where we've taken the bone out and use the skin to push it in. That's it. Now at this point, I think you'll begin to think we're not going to have enough stuffing to put in the bird. But in fact, you really don't want to fill the stuffing into capacity. You've just got to remember that as it cooks, the stuffing will swell out and you really just want a nice fat roll down the middle. So we'll give that a squeeze together. Tuck all the spare bits in. Pull this skin up. We're now going to do a little sewing job. And it's easier to get, it's better to sew it and get a nice shape than leave it uh, with skewers in it, as sometimes I think I've suggested that you tie it in the recipe. But if you can, find an old needle, a big darning needle, or as I've got here, an old mattress needle with a bit of thin string in it, and I want to stitch this together just to hold it while it's cooking. Nice big stitches. I don't think you have to worry about the shape of them. That will hold it together while it's cooking. And turn it over, ready for going in the tin, which I've already got in the oven. There we are. I like also to put one skewer in the thighs, just to hold them together. Oh, that's the needle I've put in. I better put the skewer in. That's it. Now that's it, ready for the oven. Now go and get the tin, which is already melting the... Um, fat. I've already melted in here three ounces of very nice bacon fat because it gives a very good flavour. So turn the bird over and in it goes, ready for cooking. But before I put the lid on, I want to put the rest of that lovely parsley butter over the top so that it runs down into the bird and also into the gravy, which will give a lovely flavour uh, to your gravy at the end of this, when I've got this cooked. Now, I've got a lid for my old tin. Somebody told me they actually saw one of these tins in an antique shop the other day. But if you don't have a lid, use a uh, foil. And I like to put the foil not tucked around the outside of the tin, but well inside. Now, for this size of turkey, with the stuffing in it, Put it into an oven, a hot oven, gas six, 
400 degrees Fahrenheit, 200 degrees centigrade, and this will take about one and a quarter to one and a half hours. But if you've got a different size bird, weigh it once you've got the stuffing in, and then calculate it at 15 minutes to the pound and 15 minutes over. And then your bird should be perfectly ready for cooking. Now from the bird, which is ready for the oven, we'll jump a little bit and start with the gravy to go with it. Now in the pan here, I've got the residue from the bird that we cooked for on the table. And the residue, of course, is the fat and all the nice little crispy brown bits that came off the bird while it was cooking. And what I want to do now is pour as much fat as I can off this uh, residue. And we'll pour it into my little pot dish here. You must aim at a fairly fat-free gravy. Try and hold it back so there's just the, the, the nice gravy residue in here. Turn that heat down a little bit. I want to sprinkle in one ounce of whole wheat flour. Not all of it. Let it sizzle for a little while until the uh, flour is cooked. I haven't used all of it. I'm not terribly fond of a very thick gravy. I like it thinner than usual. And in the pan at the front, I've got some stock. Now, this stock was made by cooking my giblets, which are in a bowl at the front. You can see them. The giblets is, are the heart and the uh, liver and the kidney. And all that has been simmering in the pan here with an onion and a piece of carrot and a bay leaf and about four uh, black pepper corns. You can see them there. And they've been simmering for an hour until... Uh, I've got this lovely, rich flavoured stock ready for the, um, the gravy boat. Stir it round until it's almost ready. Now, if you like a very smooth gravy, you can always strain it as you put it into the jug. And, of course, if you've got any lumps, of, that's the best time to get rid of them. Well, that's just about ready now. I've dropped my cloth and pour it straight into the... Turn the heat off, into the gravy boat all ready for the table. That's it. Now there's your bird and the gravy. I'm going on now to the vegetables. I'm doing glazed parsnips, and that's on page 76. Before I start the vegetables, I want to mention our new potatoes. This dirty box that's lying here actually was dug up out of our garden. And this is one of the easiest and cheapest ways of getting new potatoes at Christmas. When you dig them up in the summer, get an old biscuit tin, such as I have here, and put your lovely potatoes, pick them all nice and evenly sized, into it with some soil and a bit of peat. Dig them up on Christmas Eve, and there you have some beautifully. And they still keep that lovely, freshly dug flavor. Very nice they are, too. Just a little tradition that's grown up in our family, and we just always do it now. But I think if you try it, you might be surprised at how nice they are. Well, to get back to the vegetables, I'm starting with Sarah Brown's recipe for parsnips and walnuts. And in the pan here, I've already got a pound of scrubbed and sliced walnut, um, parsnips steaming. And that is one of the very best ways to do vegetables, to steam them. Now, if I can tip this up slightly, I wonder if you can see the holes in the bottom of this pan. This is a proper steamer pan, and underneath the, the water is not touching them. That's one, a good way to get them really well cooked, but not but just tender and no more. So a pound of parsnips there, and I'll put them down here for a minute, pour out the water, and into the pan, I better put some heat on though. I'm going to put two ounces of butter quite a lot of butter, but this is a very delicious and rather um, special recipe. So let that melt, and into that as well, three ounces of chopped walnuts, a whole teaspoon of fresh rosemary, and don't forget if you use dried, to halve the quantity, because uh, dried uh, herbs are always much more pungent and strong than they are, and two tablespoonfuls of parsley. Let the butter melt, 
and into that toss back your parsnips and toss them round and round in this buttery mixture so that they all become lovely and golden. And then dish them up right away and you know that vegetables are the last job you do so that they're absolutely in perfect condition. We'll put the heat out, turn them back. And there they are, all ready for the table with that unusual addition of walnuts. Now the other vegetable I have uh, done is the traditional one of Brussels sprouts. And I don't think Christmas dinner would be the same without Brussels sprouts. And perhaps you can see that I've hardly pared them at all, kept as much green leaf as possible. And this is another little uh, way of steaming. It's a little gadget that you can buy that folds up into a, uh, this rather nice handy shape keeping again your vegetables out of the water so that they steam just to perfection, barely cooked and no more, and keeping all their color and uh, vitamin content. So they're the two vegetables all ready for Christmas day, and I'm starting shortly now on my Christmas jelly, which you'll find on page 126. This is really a bit of fun, actually, this Christmas jelly. I've already got in the pan here one and a half packets of a dark jelly, black currant or black cherry, anything like that will do. Now, leave that for a second or two to dissolve in a little hot water and show you the rest of the ingredients. Now, I'm using a quarter of a pint of either port or sherry, and that has to be made up with the jelly liquid and water up to one and a half pints. Remember, it's a one and a half packet. Now that's ready now. Pour it in and top it up with the cold water so that I get up to the one and a half pint mark. And don't pour it over or the jelly won't set. That's one and a half pint and the rest of the ingredients are incredibly simple. Pound of dark grapes seeded, that's all. In the go. And I think the dark grapes give the illusion of a Christmas pudding, don't they? Two ounces of raisins, two ounces of almonds, chopped again, not too small. Stir it round and leave it to set overnight if you can. Leave a spoon in it to keep stirring it so that the fruit doesn't all sink to the bottom. But give it a stir every now and again until it's on the point of setting. Now I have one already set here, which I'm hoping to turn out. I've got a bowl. A sink here of warm water, so I'll put it in there just to warm it slightly. I don't want to melt the jelly, but just to help it on its way. And then push it all the way around the top and turn it out. The first time, I hope. Give it a good shake. Yes, I think it's gone. There we are different kind of Christmas pudding. We've got to put the uh, holly on the top and that's all there is to it, Christmas jelly. Now at the front here I've got the starter and you can see how I've done it. I've used a curved knife to cut out my two fruits and just mix them together to make a pretty design. A little bit of mint leaf and a cocktail cherry to finish it off. And that's my starter and that's Christmas dinner already. Now, oh, just let's have one last look at our lovely Christmas table. And perhaps say that you could make your stuffing about at least four or five days in advance for your turkey, and that will stay in the fridge. But I wouldn't do the boning and stuffing until the, the day before. And then it's all ready to cook on Christmas Day. Your Christmas pudding, of course, you'll have made several weeks in advance. And your jelly will also stay quite happily in the fridge in a bowl uh, for about four days. Well, that's the end of the Christmas dinner. I do hope you've enjoyed it and have enjoyed seeing the lovely spread I have here. I want to wish you a very, very happy Christmas and a happy new year. And I'll be back after the new year with some more programs for you. Don't forget that all these recipes from our, uh, come from our book and the address for sending for that will be coming up very shortly. So a very happy Christmas. Bye-bye. <laughs>